Good morning. Thank you so much for coming to our session this morning. Just about still morning, right? Uh, I hope everybody's able to find a seat. If you have got a seat next to you, maybe shuffle along and, and let people in. Uh, yes, yeah, so my name's Liz Rice, uh, myself and John here. Do you want to say hi? Hi. Yeah, <laughs> hi, my name is John Fastman. I'm an uh, engineer at Isovalent. And uh, excited to talk about BPF today. I've been you know, working on it for almost 10 years now. So hopefully you guys get as excited as, um, as I am. Yeah, so, w I mean, as John says, he's, he works in the kernel, right? He is a proper expert in eBPF. Let's just quickly recap to make sure everybody understands what we're talking about with eBPF. It allows us to run custom programs in the kernel. So we can change the way the kernel behaves by loading eBPF programs there and attaching them to events. Why is the kernel interesting? Well, the kernel is the part of the operating system that is involved whenever we're doing anything with hardware. So if you're accessing a file, or sending and receiving over a network, or uh, even allocating memory, the kernel's going to be involved. The kernel's also um, managing the processes running on a system. So it's looking after things like permissions and privileges. So the kernel is involved in pretty much everything interesting. With eBPF, we can change the way that it behaves. So. Already, there are lots of really great infrastructure tools built using eBPF. I mean, we're both very involved in Cilium and uh, Cilium's subproject Tetragon, doing things like networking, security, observability. There are also loads of other great projects out there and great products out there that are doing things in these kind of infrastructure tooling spaces. But, Sometimes you'll hear statements that give the impression that there are limits to what you can do with eBPF. So, for example, we've heard people saying, yeah, you can't really implement like layer seven parsing. That's just too complex for eBPF. Or another thing that you'll quite often hear people saying is, yeah, but there are limits to what you can do with eBPF because it's not Turing complete, right? So, do we think those statements are true? Well. A hint here is these things were not said by people who are working on eBPF. We're going to explore these kind of statements today. So I've said the term Turing completeness. This is not going to be a computer science class. It's not going to be like super pedantic about terminology. But really what Turing completeness about is about is can we process some arbitrarily complex task? Can we process an arbitrary amount of data? Can we continue processing for an unbounded amount of time? Do we have the ability to store state so that we can continue to process state? So this is, broadly speaking, what Turing completeness is about, right? So I, I think it's interesting um, just to talk a little bit about some concrete examples, right? I mean, we could talk about the like mathematical formulation of Turing complete, but that's perhaps not interesting to everyone here. So like the, typically when we think about Turing completeness, people are really talking about like your general purpose languages, C, C++, Java, Python, Go, all the things that we um, programmers love. Um, but I, I also want to point out that there's a lot of like really also interesting, but maybe less interesting for programmers. You know, nobody really wants to write um, your uh, application in the one instruction set computer. So that's a totally valid Turing machine. It is Turing complete. But, you know, try to write a proxy with just the move instruction, and it might not be quite as fun as you want. Um, another example is the game of life that we'll go back to. But there's just loads of these things. And, you know, the, the point is try not to equate, I think, Turing completeness um, with sort of usefulness as a programming language to, um, you know, developers, right? Um, I also want to note that there's some, like, actual benefits of not being fully Turing complete sometimes. Um, you might be interested, in, for example, in having a, a parser um, that is bounded. And why would you want that? You might want that because you don't want to receive a packet and then have your parser loop forever. You really would like the thing to stop at some point. Um, you know, it's the same way like in BPF space where we do like syscall and Tetragon will watch syscalls or watch kernel functions, right? We really like to have an upper bound on the time that we're going to 
kind of impact the application or the operating system. And when you do that, you want to say like, it's really nice to say, you know, this will not run longer than a millisecond or, you know, 500 nanoseconds or something like this, right? And, and that really is not Turing complete because we're putting in a bound on that environment, but um, there's, you know, there's really concrete advantages to that as well. So just want to, you know, kind of lay that out there and, and kind of give you some examples of, of Turing complete things that are both useful and not useful and an example of maybe why you, you know, would want some bounded properties as well. And Turing completeness talks about an infinite tape, sure, right? Correct. And there is no infinite tape in the world. So in reality, we're always dealing with just large rather than infinite. Yep, exactly. So that previous slide mentioned Conway's game of life. And this is an example of something that's Turing complete. So this is something that uh, every step, it, it goes through generations every step. And each of those steps, the state of one cell is determined by it, the state of the previous state of the cells around it. So it's a little bit like an actual living cell. If the cell has no uh, living cells around it, it's going to die of loneliness. If it has too many cells around it that are alive, it's going to die of overcrowding. But if it's got the right number of cells uh, around an empty space, the cell will actually uh, come to life. So this is an example of something that can kind of go on forever generating these patterns. Very kind of common example of something that's uh, used as an equivalent of Turing completeness, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, if this is an example of something that's Turing complete, is it something that we can write in eBPF? And one reason why you might think, mm, I don't think it can, is because of this thing, the eBPF verifier. So when you load a program into the kernel, the verifier is going to run over this program and analyze the program and establish whether it's safe to run. And one of the things I would normally say when I talk about whether it's safe to run, I'll say it's not going to crash the kernel. But I would also say that it's going to run to completion. We might yeah. pause on that later. Do you want to yeah, dive into a little sure. bit more what, so, what it's really doing? Yeah, yeah. So I, th I think. Um, users of eBPF or, or even people that are higher in the stack, you know, they might think about the verifier as this kind of thing that is there stopping you from writing interesting programs, perhaps. Um, as a kernel developer, though, I want to kind of lay out what do we, as developers of the kernel, that we want to ensure that the kernel's safe to run and all this kind of stuff, what do we think the verifier is doing, right? And, and specifically, this is kind of my criteria. Um, you know, the first thing we always want to do when we load a BPF program in to the kernel is we want to make sure that we can only read memory that is allowed by that program and by your permissions that you have when you load that program. And, and BPF has a whole series of places you can hook in the kernel. You can hit kernel functions. You can hook the networking stack. Um, you can even hit user space. And, and depending on where you hook, you'll have different permissions on what kind of memory you can read, right? And so we want to make sure that your program is only reading memory it's supposed to. And we, Definitely 100% want to make sure that you're only writing to memory that you're allowed to. You know, want to make sure that you're not writing to random spots in memory. You're only writing to you know, valid locations in your BPF program. Um, the next one is we want to make sure that the control flow is well formed and that uh, it's valid and in bounds. We don't want you to just jump your BPF program off into the kernel somewhere and run arbitrary code and crash the kernel, right? Don't want to make sure that happens. And I think the fourth point here is really interesting because we've, we've actually evolved this over time. It's like, what does it mean for eBPF programs to be bounded in the kernel? And if you think way, the original BPF, that meant the program ran to completion. But over time, we've sort of evolved BPF. Now BPF programs know how to sleep. We know how to do callbacks and iterations. We know how to keep a program running, and we'll go into that in a little bit. Um, and really what we want to verify in the verifier is that we don't get a program stuck on the CPU so long that it looks and feels like the system is hung, right? And for kernel developers or, or people that are really system level programmers, I think this is a sort of intuitive concept because you've been writing in this low level. If you're, if you're higher up in the stack and maybe an application programmer or um, kind of a distributed systems programmer somewhere in there, it may be foreign because um, you don't have to worry about this stuff because the OS is doing all the context switching, right? You, you never, in, never write an application in user space, C++, C, Go, whatever, where you go, like, at this point, I need to make sure that I release the CPU, right? Because the, the OS just deals with that for you, right? Once you get yourself into the kernel, into the, you know, kind of the deep system stuff, you really need to um, tell the OS when it's okay to, um, to 
let your program off the CPU, right? The reason we do this is really if you're in an interrupt context, if you're uh, trying to write some kind of locking and stuff like this, we can't just you know, release it um, at any arbitrary point. Um, and then the last thing we want to do with the verifier is we want to make sure like locks and references are all accounted for. And that, that's sort of a, a, an accounting detail, but it's important if you're going to like reference a socket or reference a file. Um, walk a path. You want to make sure that those things exist when you're doing that. And that's just a um, kind of a correctness property. So th those are the things, um, you know, that, that I think about when I'm working on the verifier or improving the verifier um, over time. So. And I think as we'll see later, this idea that eBPF continues to evolve and continues to improve over time because of the work that people like John are doing, this is why we're able to perhaps do more with eBPF than you might imagine, because it continues to improve. Yeah. So, All right. John, can we <laughs> run Game of Life in eBPF? All right, we're going to give it a try here, because we like to do demos. So what you see here is, um, this is just basically Tetragon, um, but we added a new sensor to Tetragon called Game of Life. All right, and so we're going to kick it off. Um, what it did here is it just iterate, created the, very similar to what Liz just showed you with that um, web app, is it created a, a map, filled in some cells with some random pattern, and we could load it from a BPF map or something if we wanted to, but for the, for the demo, it's just a random map, and now it's running, and it's, there it goes. All right, so while that's running, let's uh, dig into how you were able to get this to, to work. Yeah. So, this is just a brief, I'm not going to go into all the details of everything here, but this is basically the core um, code that is running right now in the background, and we'll get back to it. But the important pieces I do want to call out is that very far left for you guys is do game. This is our core game logic for life here. And you can see kind of three things. We copy the cell map. It's basically taking the old state, copying it into the new state so that we have a, a good state for the next iteration. We do the next iteration, which is all of those rules are run that Liz was talking about. You check to see if, you're, um, if your neighbors are alive, live or you create a new cell or you remove a new cell. So that's the sort of the business logic of this program. And then we send an update, all right? So what the update does is it sends that map state up to user space. You know, unfortunately, you know, I don't have a, a BPF graphics library yet. So, you know, if somebody's interested and they're like a GPU shader from BPF or something, to come talk to me. Let's make it happen. But I couldn't do it from BPF, so I had to send the map up to user space. Slightly disappointing, but doesn't really impact, you know, the, the logic of the game, right? So the user space is actually taking that BPF map and just drawing it on the screen there is what you were seeing. And then the last piece is this run next, which just reruns the business log, but goes back to the beginning of do game and runs it again every two seconds. All right, and we'll talk about how that happens. Other slides you can get to in, in, your, in your spare time later if you're interested. So you may have heard that eBPF programs are limited to only a small number of instructions. So maybe let's dive into that. Yeah, um, this is, you know, what. It, What's really interesting here is, you know, when we first landed BPF in 4.14, um, back in like 2015, kind of the first iterations, um, we really started at 4,000 instructions. And like, why did we pick 4,000 instructions? Because it seemed like a good number. It's, you know, kernel developers like, you know, like numbers with K at the end of them, 496 sounds good, right? Um, that was interesting, but we very quickly realized that, you know, 496 is kind of small. Right? You might want more instructions. Um, and the, the other thing I think is important, why do we have to have a limit, was not primarily because um, we need the program to, to terminate in some finite time, and we decided 4K instructions was a good amount of time. But I think it's really, if you think about it, we have to verify that program. And we really want to make sure that when you load a program into the kernel, it takes some reasonable amount of time, you know, less than a second. Right? If you loaded a 20 million, um, line code program, perhaps, maybe it would take 20 seconds. And, you know, we kind of thought, well, that's a long time, right? So keep it bounded. But at one, some point, we decided that 4K was just too limiting. People want to write things that are bigger than 4K. And so in 5.4 kernels, we went to 1 million, um, and it kind of beefed up that allow allowable limit. Um, just to kind of follow up, you might wonder, like, that's interesting, John, but 
give me some kind of reference. You know, like how many instructions really is a million instructions? And so what I did is just, this is kind of a napkin approach, you know, go look at a few programs I had on my laptop. Of course I had Doom, right? Gotta have Doom there. So, you know, I took a look. It's, you know, less than a thousand K instructions for a, for a basic kind of Doom clone, if you think of the, like the original Doom. And then I had Envoy on my system because, um, you know, we work on Cilium and Tetragon and that uses Envoy as a kind of one, one option for doing proxies. I took a look, 15 million instructions. And then Clang, uh, you know, compiler stuff, 26 million instructions. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, you know, you might come back and say, okay, Doom is only a, maybe less than 1,000, 100,000 instructions, but John, it might have some loops. How are you going to deal with that, right? And then stay tuned. We'll talk about how to get these kind of much larger cases going forward. So there's also this idea that, and it was true in the early days, that you couldn't do loops in BPF because you were only able to jump forwards in a program. Yeah, so this was something that we put in, and it, not because necessarily BPF, like um, folks that were working on BPF thought, hey, loops are somehow bad. It was purely like the verifier needs to somehow ensure that this isn't going to run forever, right? Um, and that was the early days, and so we simplest thing to do is look at your program and ensure that you don't have any jumps to code that you've already been to, right? We want to make sure that it, the program control flow is a DAG, basically a graph and no loops in that graph. Um, so early programming, what we did is we did something called, called an unroll. Basically, you tell the compiler, I'm not allowed to do loops. Please just cut and paste this code, right? It'd be very similar to a developer just doing like cut, cut, paste their loop many, many times. You kind of do that, but you can see very quickly that you're not going to be able to get things to, to run very long, right? Especially in 4K instructions, but even with a million instructions, you know, you're kind of only so much can be done. Yeah, yeah so clearly not, a, not an approximation of forever, right? When you're kind of in this space. Um, the next piece here is we have, we, as we were evolving BPF, this became a very obvious sort of limitation, right? The fact that the it, it, limitation in two ways, two ways I'd say is one is it makes it hard to write programs, and two it makes it hard for the compiler to compile things, you know, optimize your code basically. So we added loops. This is this allows the verifier to look at a loop and verify that that loop is going to terminate. Um, and then we added a, a, actually a helper call for cases where you want the BPF program to do a loop, but the compiler, human, and verifier are having trouble all agreeing on how that loop is going to look like actually. And if you think about the assembly code and object code when it's loaded in the compiler. And once you have this, you can write statements like that at the bottom where you have a for loop. H here is a, um, is a you know, kind of a pound defined or a global variable that tells you how the max loop size. And, and the verifier is perfectly happy with this um, today. So that's, we're allowed to loop, but we're not allowed to loop indefinitely at this point, right? Correct, yep, that's why we have that max there. And so if you just kind of take a layout of what kernels these were added in, you know, you had 414 and 419, we had our kind of basic cut and paste model. 5.4, we added loop support so the kernel could figure out how, if these loops are going to terminate. 5.15 made a bunch of technical improvements to that, so the verifier got much better at finding these things. And then 6.1, we added this um, call that you can do to basically you as the human can tell the verifier through the compiler that, hey, this is going to be a loop. Please take a look at it and make sure that it terminates. Yeah? And I just wanted to call this out because um, you know, we have people working on this. The, comp the BPF side is just evolving continuously. So there's another type of loop coming. We're not going to talk about it here. Find me afterwards if you want. But an even, even uh, more improved version of looping is, is on the way. So, please. OK, so we've got a limit to how many uh, instructions, but it's quite a big limit. We can loop. Yeah, yeah. What about these yeah. big programs? What about these right? big programs? Like, can we do Envoy or Clang? Could you write, in theory, a $15 million, $15 million instruction a PPF program? Uh, that would be great, right? Um, the thing that is interesting, and I, I think it's, it's a choice we made very early on in the BPF um, kind of verifier, is we called these things subprograms. And we said subprograms must terminate. Roughly equivalent, a subprogram is, is really roughly equivalent to a function. And so the limits are actually on the functions, not on the entire program. And as sort of a back of napkin, you can do like uh, 31 function calls or 31 subprograms is what a BPF programmer would say. And really, that gets you up to you know, 15 million without much trouble, 31 million actually with 31 calls, right? Um, you can actually do more in the kernel depending on where you're actually being 
where you're hooking, but sort of as a rough estimate, we can pretty easily get to 31 million instructions, which is a really big program, right? You can, all of Clang is not even 31 million instructions. So give you some words of warning, you know? This, uh, the verifier is getting better and better and better, and people are working on this and making it usable for humans um, to write code, right? Um, but really the trick right now is the human's gonna write the code, the compiler's gonna compile it, and the verifier's gonna verify it, and they all need to kind of be in sync and understand what's going on, right? Um, to get the kind of something into the kernel, right? And this is why it's just not as easy as it should be. You know, the team is working on this. Um, I fully predict that in five years, 10 years, something like that, BPF will be easier and easier to write and, and kind of open up that, that uh, number of people that are you know, willing to dive in and really get into the BPF space. Um, and then the last thing, you know, if you do go this way and you maybe have the right mentality, it might be addictive. You might try to write things like Tetris and Doom and Quake and Game of Life in the kernel. Um, you know, the utility of that is um, kind of great for KubeCon talks, right? <laughs> I'm not sure, you know, like <laughs> isovalent enterprise will have a, or, you know. Yeah, we're, do we're doing the isovalent enterprise launch of Game of Life. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah, yep. Um, so Game of Life, you know, it goes on forever. So what about this idea of not terminating? Yeah, so this is an interesting one, right? So like, if you want something to run forever, I've told you there's a maximum instruction. You're like, well, certainly you're going to run out of those instructions at some point, right? And this really goes back to, this kind of carefully worded um, point in the verifier where we said, well, it's not just that we want the program to terminate, it's that we want to release the CPU that we're on. We don't want to lock a CPU down. And, and like we said, early on, early kernel versions, that meant the program terminated. There was no exceptions to that, the program was done. Um, but when we evolved the um, kind of kernel and BPF and the verifier and the compiler as well, like all these pieces are moving forward, we developed these kind of other ideas of kind of really other ways to release the CPU. Um, one of them was that an iterator. This is a program that can like run over every file in a directory, right? It doesn't matter how many files are in there and it'll basically ensure that the CPU doesn't get locked up, right? It's been iterating for too long, it'll release, let something else run, the scheduler will come back and say, okay, BPF program, you can run again. Um, we've allowed programs to sleep now. So this is really useful if like, you're trying to read some memory and it gets the page fold. So the memory is not in, in the page cache, so you can't just read it, because it's not there. Um, and so you have to do something called a, a page fold, which requires sleeping. Anyways, it's, it's in the details, but super important if your BPF program tries to read some memory in it, you, know, you don't want to get a fault. We added timer callbacks. This is basically a way to say, hey, I've done something useful. Um, I'm gonna release my program, let the OS do something, and then just call me back at some time. You can even set this to zero, which just looks like, hey, I'm done. Um, but you know, I'm safe to release, but call me as soon as you can again. So. And I guess the last thing is, you know, how can an eBPF program allocate some amount of memory? Yeah, so the, um, there's really a bunch of different ways we can do this, but the most obvious one is that we have these array maps, and the maps are basically memory blocks that the program can allocate, or user space can allocate and then give to the program. And um, these can be actually quite large. The basic limit of these is, you know, like whatever the user space is allowed to allocate based on its C group. If it's not in a C group, they can be more or less unbounded and kind of related to system memory and all this kind of stuff. We have some limits, but those are tied to like how much RAM you have in your system, right? Same type of thing that a user space application has. You can't allocate more memory than, you know, your system has available, right? So. So we could potentially have a pretty big uh, sort of field of play for our game. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, even you know, four gigabytes, we've sort of optimized this case in newer kernels to allow applications up to four gigabytes of virtual memory. Um, so. Amazing stuff. So, with all of these component pieces put together, we've really avoided mm -hmm. the limitations, right? We don't have, uh, we, well, we don't really have a, an effective limit on how many instructions, we don't have an effective limit on how many times we can call a loop right. effectively, because exactly. we can use these timer callbacks. Shall we see? If it's still running, what do you think? Is it still running? <laughs> so, yeah, so see how good I, I am at programming, right? If it's still running or if it's still going. So here you go. Looks like it's still up and running. Um, you can see it's still doing its thing. Um, 
And if you go back to kind of some of the details, um, I think we can talk for a couple seconds here. Basically, if you think about that first program that was doing that do game, you know, what we see here is it does a copy of the last state into the new state, runs the logic, that's what moves all these kind of fields around on the screen, right? And then um, sends it up to user space, and then this is the user space just kind of printing the dots, you know, one is on, zero is off, printing the dots on the screen, and you can see it kind of it keeps evolving over time. Every, every two seconds is the limit, um, just so that you all can see it. Um, so there it goes, and it's, and it's still and, going. And you told me a pretty interesting thing about, like, the fact that you can't predict the future state. Yeah, yeah. One of the neat things about, like, Game of Life and, and a lot of terrain machines in general is that this thing will... Um, you, you, if you want to know what the thousandth iteration is or the ten thousandth iteration of this, there's no shortcut to that from a, from a kind of a mathematical side. You can't say, tell me, I'm not going to actually run this thing 10,000 steps. Let me just run it two times and then tell me what the answer is. So, like, it's interesting in that sense is you have to, you really have to run this thing to figure it out, right? Um, and uh, we could rerun it and see what pattern we get. You know, sometimes you'll get interesting patterns. This one is still running. Um, since it's a random pattern, we could have been unlucky, right, and had like the screen be black when we turned this on. But um, you know, but it well, didn't. It worked. Did, it right. did. Round of applause for a live demo, please. Oh, it's great. <laughs> Perfect. Yep. Go back. <laughs> Amazing. So we have Game of Life in eBPF, which is really a good demonstration that you can today do arbitrarily complex tasks with eBPF. So those statements about things like, can you do layer seven protocol parsing in eBPF? Absolutely, it's possible. Doesn't necessarily mean that all these things have been Im implemented yet, but it is possible to do you know, pretty much any processing. Maybe not necessarily to do the display part yet, but the actual mm -hmm. computation part, the processing part. And, and I would say the key is there not yet. I mean, I, I think the really interesting thing, or one takeaway I think from this talk is like, you know, there's a bunch of folks in the kernel and the compiler community, and you know, we're working to make BPF better and make BPF improve BPF. So if you have a use case, and if your use case is graphics on GPU for your KubeCon talk, come talk to me. <laughs> it would be interesting, you know? Like, so these things can be, we can make them happen, right? You know, in 10 years ago when we got started, we had like this very small scope and, you know, it just keeps growing and growing. The community's getting bigger. You know, it's kind of a, its own sub community with eBPF. But, um, you know, I, I think definitely if you have a use case and you think there's value in it, you know, come talk to us and we can, we can figure out what it, what it takes to make it happen. And I think when we think about Cilium, you know, Cilium is using eBPF for lots of network-based processing. And, you know, our vision is to push more and more of that processing into the kernel. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's tons of networking-related processing happening in user space today where I'm not going to tell you that, it, you know, we're writing it and it's going to be released next week. That's not what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But I'm trying to say the vision is that more and more of this Absolutely. processing will be happening in the kernel. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I would also just say absolutely the same for, I, I work on Tetragon mostly these days, it's the same thing. Early we started on Tetragon a couple years back, you know, there was missing features, we added the features, and then you, you figure out how to bridge the gap in the interim. But if you look forward in two, three years, you can see like all the cloud providers will have that kernel, all the uh, distributions will have that kernel, and you can start to use that functionality, right? And that's, I think, um, a really powerful kind of, kind of point of the open source uh, effort here. So I hope that's convinced you that eBPF is, well, probably more powerful than you thought. <laughs> if you want to learn more about eBPF, we have uh, some books that you can download from isovalent.com. There's also a ton of really great labs on the website. There is the eBPF.io site, which has loads of information about eBPF itself and lots of projects that are being uh, built using it. Uh, we're also doing, uh, well, I'm going to be signing some books at the Isovalent booth at 1 o'clock today. So if you want to come around and pick up a copy of the book, then uh, please say hello. And with that, I hope you have a wonderful wrap-up to the end of your KubeCon.